I'm not here yesterday, and I'll tell you where I was in a second, but my name is Kelly McElhaney, and I am on the faculty at the Haas School of Business and just launched a new center for gender, equity, and leadership, and I mean just. In other words, nobody really knows we exist yet, so I'm so happy to have met Anno and Christy, who are really wonderful in saying, will you, will you work with us on this conference, which I just need to tell you, I've been at Berkeley for 15 years, and my experience at Berkeley is not that much cross-collaboration across schools, and so it's fitting, it's, it's, well, pretty obvious, but wonderful to me that the first, you know, center I start around gender and equity, immediate collabor collaboration happens, so I think that's um, great. So yesterday I was in Denver, Colorado, well, actually for the past two days, speaking at, for a large, unnamed commercial real estate development company, very large, and they asked me to speak to their, their senior executive leadership team who were in from all over the country. So guess who was in that room? What do you think the room looked like? We had, they had 44 white men, one Hawaiian man, and two women. Which isn't shocking, a uh, little daunting. The funniest part of the story is three weeks ago, people, students who know me or people who know me know I'm woefully last minute. People tell me my product is beautiful, my process is really ugly, like sausage. So they sent me this template three weeks ago. They said, we want you to use, this is our standard corporate template for your talk. And three days before, I was getting ready to fly out. I opened the template, and unbelievable. Template, background, two construction foremen with their hats on. So my title slide is the value of investing in diversity with these two white foremen in the back. And of course, I had to take a picture of it and send it to everybody. I know you can't make this crap up. Look at this. <laughs> Um, and then I had to recruit my undergrad, because I can't really understand how to do PowerPoint templates on my own, to come in and superimpose a woman next to the man, and I used that template. I used their slides for the first two, and then I subtly switched to mine, and very, at the very end, I just had a blank slide, and I said, did anybody notice anything along the way with my talk? No. And all of a sudden, one man said, oh, that's a woman up there. <laughs> so it was really funny, but to be fair, the men were fantastic. I, they had me uh, an effective strategy. They had me come in the night before, which I hate to do, because I have kids and work, and I hate to travel more than I need to. But they said, please come in the night before and join us for cocktails and dinner. So I walk up onto the rooftop of this beautiful hotel that they had just finished building in Denver. And it's all these men, and everybody just goes, you know, and I, I'm like a new kid at the school. I don't know who to talk to, so I go right to the bar and get a drink. <laughs> it's always the best person to start talking to. And it was just really fascinating how repel, I felt very, uh, felt some repellent. Then we walk to a restaurant. We pass a dance club. I hear some men say, oh, is that where we're going after tonight, after dinner? And, you know, it's just a really interesting environment. Sit at dinner. Most of the tables are full when I get there, so I sit at my own new table alone for about five minutes, which is horrifying. I'm sweating. And then a bunch of men just came from other tables and sat down. One of them happened to be the CEO. I didn't actually know that at the time. Fast forward, gave the talk. Unbelievable. I had men crying. I had a man tell a really compelling story of how much gender harassment his wife had experienced. I had men talk about their daughters and how after I showed the data, this is no way a world that they want their daughters to enter. And it was just really impressive. We talked about unconscious biases. I had a man stand up and say, I have a very strong bias against LGBTQ, and I work on it every single day. I grew up in small town, southeastern United States, and it is just very hard for me. And I had the, one of the two women, women in the audience who's lesbian, married, wife is a doctor at UCSF, two beautiful kids, walk up to him and give him a hug. And he didn't know she was lesbian. So it just was an amazing day, and that's what I really want to talk about today, is what works. What really works in terms of, now I'm not going to tell you the needle was moved, because that was the first entree into this company, but the, the COO who brought me in texted me as I went to the airport, and he said, unbelievable feedback, most of which was, thank God we're finally having this conversation. Because this is not the kind of company I want to leave. This is a 110-year-old company. This is not the kind of company I want to hand over to the next generation. So it was, it was really fun. S start out with a business case. Seems like a no-brainer. I do believe this is the right thing to do, but I never walk into an audience and start with that. It's just not effective in a business situation. That may not be right, but as I tell my students all the time, you can choose to be right or you can choose to be effective. And my goal is to be effective. So I start out with the data. First thing I do is say, I'm a former banker. 
I didn't ever want to be a professor. Here I am. I wanted to be Wonder Woman. That didn't work out. I became a banker, was miserable. But the beauty of that is everything I do is, is focused around return on investment. So this is a pure investment play. You're leaving money on the table. And here's why. And I start out with the data. I start out with a global uh, gender gap index. That is, uh, Laura Tyson is a co-author of it, one of our, or you heard from her yesterday. And it looks at straight up gender parity in a country and GDP. And when it's a GDP play, there's no country in the world that doesn't want to increase their GDP. And there's no company that doesn't want to operate in a country whose GDP isn't going up. So I start with the macro. Then I generally get into the financial return, all correlative, not causal. Um, when your N is as small as it is in terms of looking at women on boards and women in leadership, you can't, and I just get really snotty. If anybody here has ever done Statistics 101, you can't do robust analysis if your N is small. So if you want the robust statistics to improve, then let's move up the N. And then I quote Jeffrey Sachs, who once said at a conference where we were on the same panel, even the most rational mind, after 100 correlative studies, would start to infer causality. And you know, it's hard for them to argue with a Nobel Prize winner, so I, these are all my strategies. But I talk about the return on equity, the return on investment, the total return on sales. And this is with companies who have one or more women on the board or one or more women in leadership. Uh, I quote a study that Sanaz, who will be presenting later and who presented yesterday, PhD student at Haas, we looked at Morgan Stanley's ESG ratings of companies, environment, social, and governance performance, and zero women on the board, one or more women on the board, and we found statistically significant correlation with improved environmental performance, improved social performance, and improved govern governance performance. In other words, fewer CEOs being carted off in handcuffs when you had one or more women in the leadership team. Um, so I just go through all of those. I talk about collective intelligence. I don't have my iPhone right now, but I was once working two years ago at, on a project with Walmart.com, except they're now Walmart Global E-Commerce. They seem to keep branding for a longer name. But the, the, the e-commerce side of Walmart here in Burlingame or San Bruno, and I was working with them on a new leadership model that we were subversively trying to shift the preva prevailing successful leadership model to be a little bit more feminized. We didn't tell them that. We just went in, we called it the next gen leadership model. And in that consulting project, uh, a man stood up in the room, his name was Raj, and he said, I want to tell you a story about Helena. And Helena's in the room and her face gets really like red. And he said, so my team was working on a product. It's a project, product whereby shoppers in bricks and mortar Walmart could walk through and scan their items, and it was just a faster product. They couldn't check out, like at Nordstrom, when you buy shoes, you can check out really fast right on that little thing. It was, it was more to expedite the checkout process. But what it really was, was Walmart mining data, because that's what they do. So did she shop high or low? What did, she, what did she scan and then put back? End of aisle, you know, just to look at the pattern through the store, what backtracking. Um, so Raj is telling us that here's the project. We were delivering two spec under budget three days before, and that's an engineering dream, right? So he acquires an engineer named Helena. Helena's with the team three days before they're supposed to deliver, which is also three days early. And the second day on the team, she comes in and she said, you know, I just, bear with me, hear me out, very feminine, right? I'm sorry, but listen to something that I have been thinking about. I went home and did some research last night, and a phenomenon we experience at Walmart is a high amount of credit card declines at the register. And she says, it strikes me that's a huge loss of dignity when you're at a crowded register and you go to pay and your credit card's declined. So, and the guys are like, oh no, here we go. And she said, look, I just added a little product enhancement right in the corner because, by the way, the average family of four has a $50 a week budget at Walmart. That's the average budget for Walmart shoppers, family of four. So she said, it's a little budget calculator so the, the shopper can walk in, put their max amount to spend, scan and an alarm goes off when they have reached their budget. And Raj said that the silence in the room, she's already built it, so it's not gonna make them go longer. And he said, I, I am here to tell you that men are not bad, but we would not have ever thought about that. And the research bears this out. When a man looks at product specs, project specs, RFP specs, Men are, they view that as a guardrail process. They're gonna deliver to every point that is in the spec. They're gonna answer every question that the company RFP has. 
whereas women don't see those guardrails. They make connections, they ask the client more questions. So I see you're looking for bullet point one, two, three, have you ever thought about this? And it's just a different style. Not better or worse, because men show in the sales process with an, a, request for pro, um, a request for proposal, they move to the yes as fast as possible. They see it as a yes, no meeting. Yes, you're gonna hire us, no. And again, women kind of ask more questions, build the relationship. But it was such a beautiful story, because Raj just said, Helena, brought that because she brought such a different perspective. And these are the things, sure, I'm a big storyteller and this really helps when I talk to companies about these sorts of things. And then finally, I just wanna talk and open it up to Q&A about some companies who I think are doing great work in this space. The first company is Boston Consulting Group. Probably the consulting, consultancy who's doing the most substantively in this space and is talking the least about it. McKinsey does fantastic research Deloitte does fantastic leadership strategies. BCG does the whole, in my opinion, the whole gamut. They just released, um, and I have an NDA, so I can just tell you a little bit about it, but it's still proprietary. They were looking just at their own company at BCG, and they were looking at two things, satisfaction rates for women and retention rates for women. So they did a significant amount of analysis to understand where were the gaps. And the gaps came down in three buckets. The first is relationship. I'm gonna use their language. And then I'm gonna have to rip and, rip and shred this, because again, I'm just kidding, it's proprietary. <laughs> they found that the significant gaps in terms of women's satisfaction and retention were in three buckets. Um, relationships, having personal relationships, and sig specifically, it's a consultancy. They feel like they had good relationships with their partner on the project. The project ended, and then they never saw from that, they never heard from that partner again. So that was one really interesting area. Communication and the predominant prevailing successful style of communication. And the third word was um, performance appraisals and the feedback they got. So just a few things. And from this data, they went very granular into each of those three buckets and developed strategies, tested them, came back and refined them, tested them for two years, um, and now they put together a program called Big A, Small I, Big A, Apprenticeship in Action. And they have now been doing it for five years, by the way, with everybody, not just with women. So this is a program that they unveiled for everybody. They have had 18% increase in the satisfaction with the, um, the um, performance appraisal process. They have had 10% increase in satisfaction with the relationship and 18% 8, increase in satisfaction on the communication. The bottom line is they now have the same amount of retention for women and men in the company, which is really big in a consulting firm because it's an up or out, high degree of travel, it's a tough place for women who still carry a disproportionately large amount of childcare and healthcare. But let me just tell you a few stories, one of my favorite stories uh, on the performance appraisal. Not unlike a lot of companies, not unlike we faculty here in our performance, uh, on our teaching evaluations, it was a very weakness oriented. Here's what you need to do better, here's what you don't do. Here's what I witnessed that you, that you could have really improved on. So the quote was from an employee, I feel like I was courted by BCG in the recruitment process, and then I got here and I was prop promptly dumped. And I thought that was super powerful. So what they did was they looked at, let's change from weakness-based to strengths-based, which doesn't sound like rocket science, right? But then when you get really granular into the types of things they did, one quick example, uh, people, women, and this came from females and um, folks from the Asian population inside of BCG, were told, you need to be more confident. You need to speak up at meetings. Well, that's pretty useless information, right? Because it's not like I'm gonna go to the next meeting more confident or start speaking up immediately. So the way they just turn that around is, so we have this meeting, we did all of this analysis. What part of the analysis, Kelly, are you most comfortable speaking on tomorrow? So then I got to own it, and then I got to prepare and when it came to me, I knew I was gonna speak on this analysis, I knew I had done it, and I felt very confident. And just these little, what I am learning in this world of, of diversity and equity is it's, it's not, it's little small nudges make profound difference. Um, one of the other, the communication styles one, I thought it was funny. The communication style, the prevailing communication style that was rewarded at BCG was take up space. So it was things like, concise, get to the point, be assertive, have a strong POV. Here's my POV, point of view. I mean, it's all this acronym. Challenging, constantly spar, competitive, um, confidence, gravitas. And 
On the other side of that spectrum is make space. Ideate, listen, read the room, collegiality, affirm, build rapport, be inclusive, and show empathy. And what, so what they found is that they were more on the take up space rather than the make space. They just changed their communication leadership training. And they really started to try to train, and they were very clear, because you need both sides of that spectrum. But it's not always changing women to take up space. It's also working with men to develop them to make space. So I could go on and on. It's a really fantastic um, program that's worked well, and they have metrics to show. And eventually, they're going to sell the model in their consulting services, which is why I can't talk about it. Um, I would love for them to hire me, because I'd love to go sell that model. It's really fun. Uh, just a few more uh, of what's working. Cisco is a company that um, I have done some work with. They have two things that I think are really unique. They have what they call a diversity heat map. And it is actually a map of various geographic regions where it's red because they see a lot of inequity in terms of diversity numbers, which, by the way, diversity is one part of the equation. And I think in the business world, we're totally just focused on diversity, and that's just counting heads. You need to get the heads in the door, but you cannot stop there. It's the inclusion piece, which is making those heads count, which is much harder. So Cisco does one thing in the diversity and one thing in the inclusion. On the diversity side, it's the, the diversity heat map. And they, they don't say, we're just going to put this company-wide strategy in place, because in fact, it's going to look different in North Carolina than it looks in Taiwan. So they really have sort of focusing on the red spots in that heat map in terms of where they're not doing well. On the inclusion piece, and I just found this really profound, they do employee pulse surveys, which is checking the pulse of their employees on satisfaction on everything. They, add, they develop a heat map on that, too. Where is satisfaction lower? Where is it higher with, what, with, with which demographic, which race, which ethnicity, uh, which sexual orientation, gender identification are we seeing red? So they developed three questions that they added to their employee um, pulse survey. One, I feel my opinion counts. Two, I feel safe in my work environment. And three, I feel like my team has my back. When they added these three questions, heat map, red, big difference in terms of how white people versus LGBTQ versus women uh, versus Asian Americans versus Latino versus African Americans. And this question, particularly, my team has my back, became one of their biggest levers. If they could push that, they could see satisfaction rates go up. Really fantastic strategy, not a one-size-fits-all. They don't talk about gender equity in terms of 50-50, because in their sector right now, it's going to be extraordinarily difficult to get there. They call it fair share. So if they are in North Carolina, and this is a percentage of coders, they looked at what are the college degrees in their recruiting base for that North Carolina. What, are, what is the percentage of degrees for females, degrees for males, degrees for African Americans? And they wanted to match that. Of course, they want to surpass it. And the CEO will say, the goal is 50-50, but I sure as heck don't want to see 85-15 percentage split. Um, going on into strategy, Intel collects a lot of data. So data is the first best thing to do, right? Because if you don't know where you are, how do you know how to change it? Intel has created diversity playbooks. Because what's going to work for an African-American man isn't the same sort of struggles that an African-American woman is facing, which isn't the same sort of strategy or challenges that, challenges that a transgender is, person is facing. So they have what they call diversity playbooks. And again, it's just recognizing the differences. It's not trying to create everybody who is the same, but it's recognizing the differences throughout. Gap Inc. is a company who I'm incredibly fond of. They just gave me the, they are now my founding corporate partner for my new center. And they did pay gap analysis when this was big deal. And they hired an outside analytics firm, which is incredibly smart, because Facebook crunched their own data. And after showing a big gender salary gap, four months later, suddenly they are at equity. That's statistically impossible. And I'm always suspect, no offense to HR folks in here, but I'm always suspect, suspect when it's the company's own data collection. And anyway, I won't go on to Google, because we were watching that segment this morning on the Google lawsuit. But back to Gap. They hired an outside analytics firm, came back and said, you have a 0% pay gap. 
Gap Inc. It's confusing, Gap, pay gap. Um, gap Inc. said, no way, that's, that's not true. Let me extend your contract, which is a consultant's dream. Go back out and splice and, and dice and sliver up the data in another way because this can't be true. Came back and said you have a 0% pay gap. So Gap is an incredibly humble company. Um, the chief human resources officer, he just retired, but was, was a Haas alum. So he and Art Pack, the CEO, came to me and said, we don't know why we have a 0% pay gap. <laughs> we don't, we don't, we want to understand more. We want to stand up as a leader. And they used to lead um, President Obama's task force on gender equity, which is no more. But Gap wanted to stand up and talk to this group of business leaders and say, we did it and here's how. So could you bring in some researchers to try to understand culturally what might be happening that led us there? Did a big study, two bits of information, very small, three I'll give you, that were just mentioned over and over again. First challenge, first issue with Gap is they were co-founded by Doris and Don Fisher, co-founded equal amounts of money put into the firm. So they have this cultural heritage, which is absolutely the foundation. Tough for me to go to say to a company, why don't you retrofit and have co-founders? So we needed to go deeper than that. Three things. A senior female leader uh, at, in the C-suite said, I, we have a, they have a flex time. It's called results-oriented workforce, where they only appraise on the results, evaluate um, employees on the results. But anyways, that senior leader said, we have a flexible work environment, but I noticed when my employees were leaving for whatever reason they left early or came in late, and it doesn't matter what the reason is, it could be going to the gym, yoga, my kid's soccer game, uh, my daughter's you know, rugby match, whatever it is, if I emailed them, they were getting right back to me. And this was frustrating to me because the whole reason they took time off was to do something for themselves. So she said, I implemented a three-tier alert system. I told my employees, look, go do what you're choosing to do. It's a flexible work environment. If I just need something from you, let's say in the next half a day, day, I'll email you. Don't worry about it. If I need it more, let's say in the next hour or two, I'll text you. If I need you right now, if this company's gonna go under without you, which by the way, it's not, I'll call you. So watch the soccer game, watch the rugby match. Go to the gym and get your phone off of the treadmill. And it had profound impact, not only in her team, but other leaders inside of Gap started to adopt it. Second thing, we heard a lot about how women did not negotiate well in the company. Heard this from female and male. So this is a struggle, a lot of research on negotiations, and won't go into all that, happy to talk about it at the break. They started a strategy whereby when a female came in, these are for internal hires, internal promotions, and she did not perform the best negotiation for, for herself. Like in a perfect world, someone would say, Kelly, look, you, you asked for $10,000 raise. We were going to give you a $40,000 raise, so here you go. Not going to happen. So what they said was, I'm going to ask you to go re re rework your negotiation and come back tomorrow with a different negotiation. And the signal was, you could do so much better, but I'm not going to tell you that. I want you to develop the skills and come back. The third strategy that we saw was when a female leader came in to quit, if she was a desirable candidate to stay, because some people should quit, when she came in and said, I want to leave, they just reframed the reaction. What would it take to get you to stay? And what they found was that 80% of the time, what it would take to get that female to stay was completely doable. So the culture there really just signaled a much stronger area, a uh, much stronger focus on equity. I could give you so many more examples. And then finally I'll talk about, because they don't get talked about, I was going to talk about Salesforce. They get a lot of, Salesforce gets a lot of press and I, I think they're doing great things and Mark Benioff, the CEO, is sort of a chest thumper and speaks out loudly, which on the one hand is a, is a um, when I met him I didn't love him at first, but now that he's thumping his chest on diversity and equity, it's fantastic. Um, because it's helping us, and it is great. He's saying, hey, you other tech dudes, leaders, what are you doing on gender diversity? What are you doing on retro pay for equal pay? But the, uh, the company I'll talk about, it's just a tiny example, but I've done some work with Twilio, and it took me about a day to figure out what Twilio does. But um, I went in and worked, mostly started out with unconscious bias training. But one of the things they ended up doing where they created these things called dibs. Now, this is a young company, totally hoodie-wearing, you know, fun group. Much more fun, I hate to say, than academia. But they created these things called dibs. And they kept talking about dibs, and this, this is the leading dib winner in this. And I'm like, what the heck is a dib? I'm Googling it under the table, because I'm just sure it's something that everybody else in the world knows, and I don't. And it, they, they created it. It's called diverse and inclusive behavior. And they gave dibs chips. 
out when they witnessed somebody do something very inclusive in a meeting, in a, anywhere. And they gave these chips out, and then you could trade these chips in for probably more hoodies at some stage. <laughs> but they just gamified it. Social badging. I get to wear the dibs hoodie. And these strategies, again, they're little nudges. And when I talk about them, I'm always self-critiquing my, you know, like, this is not rocket science. These are tiny things. But these tiny things are moving the needle. So I'm going to stop, ask for questions. I have about seven minutes and love to further the conversation. Anyone? Sorry, go ahead. Good morning, everyone. I'm really enjoying your um, presentation. You have um, so much information to share and uh, just your ideas. I'm just curious to know, it's, it's different when you're, um, for African American women, um, who, you know, are women and also... Double, um, double bind. Are we, exactly. Yeah. Um, what is some of the research or study shows and ways to um, improve um, the either performance evaluations or it's kind of the have your back? Um, we, we have to deal with a lot of stereotypes in yeah. the workplace. Um, and it can be really challenging um, when people kind of see you and have certain assumptions. So yeah. any um, information you can share about companies you work with and how they have addressed that um, and, and, or any studies that you could direct us to as well would be helpful. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for that question. It, it still gives me chills. And I'll, I'll tell you a personal story about why this gives me chills. So I have the Center for, what are we calling it? Gender, Equity, and Leadership. We keep changing the name. But I did a, I did a listening tour for three months to try to understand. I'm not interested in just being another center. So how are we going to actually create change? One of the things I heard on my listening tour was, engage men, engage men, engage men. I'm like, of course, duh. And a senior African-American female leader said to me, you know what, Kelly, first of all, I am really tired of hearing that we need to engage men. Like, really, are we still those damsels in distress that we need the white man to come down and save us? And two, if, we, if they were going to do this, they would have done it a long time ago. Like, come on. She said, let me, let me tell you, let's just call out the dirty little secret. How about women who don't support other women? And by the way, where were you white women during Black Lives Matter, except you, and then expecting us to join the Washington March when it was really a white woman's movement? So I was so profoundly struck by that, horrified that I hadn't thought about it. We ended up having this great dis discussion. So this, what I think should happen here, to be honest, is I think white women, and I'll just use African American women for this, but Latina, um, LGBTQ, I think we need to do a better job of supporting one another and understanding what the challenges and differences are. So it's one thing my center is going to do. She, one of my, another African American friend and I who's helping me develop this strategy, she said, you know, she calls it the pink elephant in the room. And, she, and we're going to do a, a blog post on this about why women don't. And her name's Trudy Bourgeois. And she just wrote a great book on this issue about why women aren't um, coming together. But then my other friend, Rosalind, the other African-American woman who I interviewed for this listening tour said, I call it the white elephant in the room. <laughs> and I loved it. Like, we need to talk about these things. We need to understand them. Now, the sad answer to your question, what was your first name? Johnny. The sad answer, Johnny, to your, first, to your question is I don't see companies other than Intel having a diversity playbook, which looks at are the issues for an African-American woman, how are they different from the issues of a white woman, and developing diverse strategy playbooks. That is the only thing. What I would tell you in the, in the corporate world and in the academic world is we've become incredibly comfortable having the gender conversation. We are not comfortable having the racial conversation or the ethnicity conversation. So I so wish I had some advice, but I think the first thing is for white women to look inward because we are reaping benefits slowly, but from this whole focus, and we are not sharing or understanding how to make it a more broad movement. So it's something my center is going to focus on. And if you have any ideas, you want to partner, I would love it. Wish I had a better, here's what somebody's doing and it's working. One thing I will cite, though, the Lean In data with McKinsey shows that African-American women have a much higher uh, um, ambition to reach the top, and they have much lower confidence. And when I say this, everybody's like, oh, why are African-American women underconfident in themselves? I'm like, it's not actually confidence in themselves. It's confidence in the system. <laughs> so that bias, boom. <laughs> you know, And uh, it's just. It's frustrating, but I think the systemic biases are obviously much more difficult. And I think we need to have research that shows what are the differences. Sorry, last thing. This is my passion topic. Um, <laughs> I also, uh, I was doing a, a program with lawyers. And one of the African-American female lawyers in the room stood up. And she goes, you know what? 
you have made me realize that from the minute I was born, I was told what, what to, how I was going to face the world as an African American, what my challenges, what, what the assumptions, what the biases. And you know, I was very well developed to understand life as an African American individual. She said, it occurs to me that I lead with my African American identity, and I hadn't actually thought about how my gender is also woven in there. And I don't lead with my woman. And this is really fascinating to me, because now I can start to triangulate between what's the African American piece, what's the woman piece, and what's both. And so I think I love this conversation. Sorry, go ahead. We have one more time. One more brief question. Go ahead. OK, yeah. Um, so a lot of the strategies that you were sharing with us are strategies that, and this is, I'm making an assumption here, so check me, um, work at an enterprise level. So if UC Berkeley wanted to do some of these things, um, they, that would sort of have to, it feels like, to, for them to be effective incredibly across the entire system, yeah. it would need to be at a, a high system level. For someone like me who uh, manages a smaller size team, you know, medium sized team, whatever you want to say, 50, 60, 70 people, yeah. what are the right strategies for us to look at that may move the needle in our own organizations and that we can actually um, show ourselves as models, perhaps, to encourage the campus to think about some other strategies? Do I have to be positive? <laughs> uh, I find it much easier to create change in the corporate sector. Yeah. Sorry. I don't know who was in this room. Um, the first thing is we need to start looking at ourselves as an enterprise, because we are. So the business case is no different at all. Um, so we have to start with the business case. We're a research institution. So I never really get off the block because they argue about my re the research. That's not useful research. That was done at Boston Consulting Group in the real world, not in a lab. Huh? You know, OK. Um, but the research case has got to be the start. And then the data collection. We, we, we cannot start that conversation here without showing the data that we've gathered. So just even talking to your group about what are the challenges. I don't, uh, this is why I spend most of my time in the corporate world, to be fair, because I'm motivated by two things, speed to market and the sense of urgency. And I find academia to be just below the Catholic Church in terms of speed to market. But to end on a positive note, I think the same, I, it's, we're talking about human beings. So while I think the prioritization of starting with heavy research, 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 data, 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 um, I, I don't think it, I don't know why it is different. I don't know why we don't realize that we are an enterprise. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Kelly.